Okay, excellent. Thank you uh, for the intro there, Jen. Um, I'll just hide all the images on the side so I can see my, my slides. So thank you very much for your time and for the intro. And also Jen and Ian um, from Darius J for the opportunity to present today and welcome all those that have signed in. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll kick forward with uh, essentially a very short bit about me. I mean, Jen, Jen's already covered a little bit about my background, but I look after a couple of companies um, Q Design Enterprises, which is my packaging uh, design firm or on structural packaging predominantly um, and a bit of brand work as well. And also the Pack Collective, which is the customer experience and service design part of my world, uh, which sort of sits in quite nice when you start to see the themes that play out through the presentation uh, about the shift from the widget to the service and to the customer experience as well. So I find that sort of go hand in hand and that'll be shown through some of the themes uh, as well. Um, this is, I guess, the visual antithesis of what I do. So uh, again, uh, going right through from insight ideation. So looking at those themes, those trends, what links up to consumers, which is the basis of the conversation today, um, and leading it all the way through to, uh, to manufacturing uh, as well. Um, and the other part, uh, I guess the other arrow in the bow there is, is the customer experience or CX as we call it and service design. And we see this playing out in the food and packaging industry is where you start to look at things like circular economy coming into play. So we're not focusing on a widget or an end product or an end destination. We start to map out the journey, the behaviours um, and look for a self-sustaining system. And so this is that thinking methodology, which is the other part of my, uh, my business. So that gives you a bit of a, uh, a background um, as to where I come from, my thinking, and I guess the, the areas that we get to be involved in and also influence. So enough about me, moving on to the actual topic at hand. And part of the first step here is looking at some of these macro impacts that we're all experiencing. We're all at home. Um, well, most of us are, those are definitely in Melbourne. Um, I think it's about probably a good half of the, the people dialing in today are in Melbourne. So we're all probably uh, juggling um, uh, households and, and places to sit. I'm on my couch at home while my kids are doing their remote schooling. They're five and a half months in and uh, my wife is on medical leave at home. So we're all sort of hopping around between wall, uh, doors and walls at the moment. But the focus here is about what these impacts are um, for us globally. So uh, I think we're all pretty much uh, well across infographics and numbers um, in all the, the daily newscasts, be it from your local premier as we are with uh, uh, Dictator Dan, as some people call him, um, in the state of Victoria, as well as uh, uh, Scott Morrison um, doing his press conferences. But this is one that I took as a screenshot from Bloomberg and it really gives you a bit of a, a running ticker essentially as to what's happening and, and the spread uh, globally. This image is from two days ago. I think it's about 26.8 million on this slide and this morning it was at 27.4. So um, it's around about a quarter of a million uh, per day globally uh, being added to this list as it makes it so slow spread around the world. And in some cases coming uh, back a second time as we're definitely experiencing, I believe I keep hearing the news feeds that we are experiencing the worst lockdown globally here in Melbourne. Um, although I'm sure some people in Argentina are probably going through similar situations that we are right now. But what's interesting is through this global pandemic in Bloomberg, a global article, there's a little red line to the bottom right there that highlights uh, uh, the impact to the Australian economy uh, with the, the news, uh, obviously, with Melbourne's lockdown. So knowing the impact it's going to have uh, on a national level from our side. And so moving on from that, we can obviously see there's plenty of indicators that we all see in the news feeds, um, in the media throughout, um, I guess, the economic um, damage that this lockdown does uh, continue to, to have on our businesses locally. Um, and again, there's a lovely little shot there of Burke Street, uh, looking a bit like tumbleweeds running through um, and very sparse of activity um, and, and any movement at all. But certainly the, the, un, the unknown aspect is really causing issues. So people constantly having to pivot. And as a designer, we're always in a situation with our clients that we, we always create situations of working with hypotheses and working towards iteration and constantly pivoting and changing but doing it on a national level with many people, industries, societies and economies that aren't really designed to pivot and move so quickly, this is where that friction is occurring. And certainly um, we have a whole list of unknowns and on to the right, we have a whole list of laws and things to do and things not to do. So now we become a situation where as a society, um, and this is myopic, obviously this part here to Melbourne, but certainly filtered 
through uh, the nation at different levels and for different time bands, uh, we're starting to have to deal with new normals, different ways of doing things, um, and also different ways of navigating, interacting with each other. And so that starts to bring in barriers to how people start to consume, behave, make decisions, and how they alter things, their needs, want ratio. So this is where the new, I guess, paradigm shift is occurring. Many of these um, are likely to maybe just handle the period of this transition through COVID, and that may be a six month or three year cycle, who knows? Um, but they're gonna be elements that may stick. And the question is what will stick over that time? So these are another little infographic I've, I've got for newsfeed. They give a snapshot to obviously Australia's the first recession in 30 years. I was literally finishing off my university degree uh, when we had our last recession, uh, around about 89, 90 uh, thereabouts and about to go out into the workforce. So, uh, so for me, um, you know, sort of seeing a lot of red um, and a lot of negative numbers or high interest rates was something that was common sight, whereas now we're probably experiencing one difference where we're in very low um, interest rate situations, which are there to encourage business investment. But when you have a look at the snapshot, here's a lot of numbers to take on board. Um, what's interesting to see is that that um, savings, that bottom left image, um, the savings going up and obviously people holding on to money. Um, and obviously those that are picking up from government grants, um, access to superannuation, all different areas of getting funding, that being either screwed away or being used for other areas where people can access it. Because when you look to the right, all of the suspending um, that we used to do when we out and about is now being really curtailed. And many of the people that are dialed in today, um, their products would normally be you know, flourishing through. Some would have impacts where they're probably slating a little bit, depending if they're in food service. Um, those particular in food service, so you know, I know uh, Bullers there as well on the line, um, those areas would be you know, hit quite hard when it comes to servicing the hotels, restaurant and cafe trade, which is down 56%. And especially if you're supporting and supplying food products towards transport or airlines, for instance, you're in a real bit of a spin if you haven't been able to pivot your business model into other channels away from your core market sector. So the days of relying on having a large single customer being tied up in a sector of 50 plus percent or being um, one customer type of 50 percent those those models where people can probably get away on lazy business models will be definitely turned upside down in the current day so that ability to be nimble and see and sit back and ask what you do with your product becomes highly important and how you get it out to the public and navigate and the upside here you can see people are spending more time at home so obviously furnishing and household goods go up uh, and obviously iso drinking um, obviously goes up so we've got no one from Diageo today but uh, certainly uh, those that actually supply that market might be feeling pretty good with the way things are tracking at the moment. And usually things like alcohol, tobacco, tobacco and condoms actually go up in sales generally during a recession when you look back in history in the last hundred years. So here's a great little um, graph that we've picked up through McKinsey. So doing some of the research in the background on here. Um, and it really maps out quite nicely, um, you know, it's like a traffic light um, overlay I've put through there, what tends to happen during uh, this, this pandemic. And as you can see, first up that, that first channel to the far left, we can see here preparing for the crisis, we've got that regulatory measure coming through. So people now being asked to do something differently and that panic comes in and as we saw so much in news feed in australia about the you know the, the toilet roll sagas that we're having with people buying all these things and that the panic of pantry loading that will follow through so we had an uptake in staple purchases so coles and woolies particularly doing very very well a lot of major brands supplying there would have also been battling to meet supply so that would have been a nice little uptick for those that are in that category but there was that shift also occurring to moving to online the contact ability into store reducing um, uh, groups of people coming forward now moving people from uh, an area that may have been laggards or people that weren't using technology that much to now suddenly having been forced to use online technology and especially in the australian mindset we technically we've been quite slow in uptake on that online purchase methodology compared to say um, Southeast Asia, where they, you know, they're quite adept, and even the Middle East, quite adept at actually doing purchasing via an online method. Um, we moved to where that navigating the crisis. Again, the peak load of, of cases, as we were seeing that sort of return here in Melbourne, um, closure of non-essential retail, and we're definitely experiencing that now, um, and the stay-at-home distancing rules that are all being applied. So suddenly, the 
um, for food starts to go through, but we're now looking at some of the fresh food ingredients to come through. And it really comes down to that hygiene level starts to, to come to play as well. The, um, the online grocery part um, starts to lift, we saw with Coles and Worse in particular, having to put a stop and cap on taking online orders because the rush was so hard with people wanting to stay at home and doing a very quick pivot across to a different channel to market being online. And having worked with those retailers in the past and, and being involved in some of their online pursuits, it's interesting to think going back just a couple of years where they were hoping for some movement in the online um, category and, and this actually pandemic in, has actually come as a, I guess, a method to push that along um, quite dramatically, which has a ripple effect all the way through. As we start to move out and come out of that crisis as well, again, we see that staggering of easing coming through. Um, and again, the people can their pennies, that, that lower spending and keeping that saving and making more wiser choices on where you might put that money. You could argue some of that also had a bit of a challenge with Australia in particular, with access to super. Um, the buy now pay later movement has been growing the last uh, several months as well, really taking things by storm. So there's probably some more delayed activity happening in that particular space coming down the road. Um, and again, that cautious return to retail. So those that might be up in Queensland and WA in particular, where things have, have returned to some element of normality um, very quickly, it's very different to definitely our experiences here in Melbourne. I've got friends up in Queensland going out to lawn bowls on the weekend with the family and friends and, and enjoying themselves and getting photos. And that was like a distant memory for me personally, um, seeing that, but that's the opposing view we have in the One Nation at the moment, the way things are rolling through. And then what's the next normal? So we know we're gonna pass through this. We know that it's a matter of time. So in two years time, this may have been part of the historical annuals and we have, we start to ask what will stick. So at the moment, we are feeling that the increased positivity is still there. People making choices to what they're doing. So the value play um, becomes top of concern for people when they're looking at product. Um, obviously, that digital engagement, um, we know at the peak, people are forced to go towards there. The question is how much would that be sticking and, and chatting through various people as well. We feel it will come down off the top, but not that much. So we feel that will now be more of an established throughput and therefore those that have moved towards that area or thinking about going to that area be worthwhile considering a digital method of access and communication to your particular audience. And obviously because of the increase of hygiene and so on, that attention on wellness and hygiene is obviously critical. We've got the obvious things like sanitizers and cleaning aids, but also about that inner wellness but how you take care of yourself during ISO uh, uh, stages and, and what's good for the body become, again, higher to the fore. Just observing the choices my own children make at the table now, um, a lot more attuned to what they're putting in their body than it was in the past before lockdown. So those sort of things become more important and top of mind. So call outs on pack about that health and wellbeing for inner health become a lot more important in that level. We spoke about nesting at home as well. And again, that cocooning. Um, and, uh, and, and certainly you can see an uptake with platforms like Kogan and Temple and Webster and so on really going through Harvey Norman, look at their share prices as an example, going through, through the roof. And that's mainly because people now have gone online, have other methods of bringing things uh, forward and realistically they're spending more time at home. So when you spend more time at home, you see more things that you're not happy with, you want to go ahead and change them. So they're diverting dollars across from one thing to the other, with then challenges about where they spend their money. So if you're selling products that might be in a premium area, how do you now speak to a different audience where their needs and wants have now altered, where wellness for themselves, increased positivity is now coming in as another four, but also spending a lot more time at home. So maybe doing you know, in-house um, meals and thinking more about the, the providence and the quality of the food they're actually preparing themselves becomes something which is a bit more important. And that redefinition of brand purpose, again, we've got a few examples of that down through this presentation. But really understanding about what your brand stands for. Some are doing overtly and others really are still sort of lagging behind an old world mentality when people are looking for a bit of support, trust and security. So I start to rely a bit more on brands helping them navigate that way forward. So it really starts to understand about what your brand really means. So there's some elements of what we feel may stick. And again, looking at some of these reports that come forward. And again, this presentation cuts on a couple of other sources as well, not just from one, to see what is the common truth as we go forward. Um, and that ripple effect, and again, you can see the points through there, 
talking about the impact, obviously, with the, the huge damage that's been caused in, in travel, um, in people getting around, and that will probably be in enduring situations when we start to have things lifted, as we see in WA and, and Queensland, where life is predominantly getting back to some element of normality, the travel bans and restrictions still are at play. So travel is only local, and as far as our ability to go overseas and, and involved areas will have an impact on food service sector, because the influx of tourists are obviously going to be a long um, period of time for that comes back to what we even class as normal levels. Um, and also that consolidation of retailers coming forward and those value retailers really now coming coming to, to the fore, people making choices on cost as a driver rather than just being a brand label in particular. Um, and obviously those that stand to win, again, the likes of Amazon, where they had a quite an established e-grocery method. Um, and again, the good thing we probably see in Australia is that we've had a stress test for the online delivery services, especially with the major retailers, and they would have learned a fair bit from that peak of that area. So that can, that can only deliver a better uh, service to us as customers down the track, and how you as a brand work with those retailers or potentially go direct to consumer as a DTC model becomes something worth discussing at border level. So continuing on, again, sourcing to see getting a sense of where things are happening overseas as well. Ian Hayes is a, one that's been around the industry and packed industry for about 20, 30 years in this country. Um, he was being based until recently in the UK um, at uh, GSK and he recently returning back to Melbourne in lockdown again. Um, and these are some of his views and points that he picked up as well. We tend to validate what we've seen in the McKinsey report. So again, that shock to law to where people now are trying a new shopping behaviour. So again, the way they engage with the brand has been changed. Um, so the reality is though, is that will likely continue after the crisis um, as well. Um, again, validating that need for hygiene and transparency. So again, we talk about low touch activities here. We're talking about things that don't engage direct contact with things. So we've had an anti-plastic push towards the produce sector in particular in the last 12, 18 months in Australia. So suddenly when you're thinking about certain products that require a lot of hand touching and holding, do you want to grab something that someone's been touching from a hygiene perspective? So now how does the packaged plastic item look in your eyes versus something like that? So choosing things that involve less direct engagement with me are now going up higher the list on the criteria of selection. Um, at that simplicity, getting back to basics. So again, that the pressure on wages, that job security, the fear of the unknown, um, the constant changing of gears and going one step forward and two step back. So that's a lot of veil of uncertainty across everyone's decision-making process. So it becomes clear in a lot of people's minds about what clearly sits in a need bucket versus the want bucket as well. And again, as we saw in that first global map, some regions are at different elevated levels of, of um, concern with their areas, whereas others are now going back to some level of normality. But again, that methodology of, I guess, that, that ration thinking mentality um, and I know, you know, being raised by my grandmother, who was a World War II uh, veteran to, to some regard, you know, that, that sort of poverty and ration mindset was, was, was brought to me at a young age. And so those sort of things start to, to resonate over a period of time. And again, I see it with my children making different choices based on basic values rather than not really having as a concern. So uh, that recession mentality is now starting to have its early stages of kicking in. So what does that do with people who want to start having a choice of buying particular brands on shelf? And how do you change your language on pack or your communication support to appeal to someone who has that particular change mindset? Um, and again, the validation, again, that home body economy. And we've actually seen a lot of this back in 2008. So we actually had that cocooning term that, that had played out as well. So um, during that time, people were spending a, a lot more time, um, uh, obviously saving money um, and, and not wanting to travel and go out. So they were sort of, you know, cocooning at home and, and spending more time insular and inward um, thinking. So this has certainly been one that has been prevalent, especially in North America in particular. So this is a validation to some of the findings that we're seeing reports, some observations from the UK in this particular case um, as well. And here's another one here from Deloitte. Um, looking at some of the themes that they're actually looking um, and have actually noticed as well in the industry. Um, and you'll notice on a lot of these slides as well, which most you'll have the deck, I do have hyperlinks down below. So the detail of these reports are actually via those hyperlinks. So I'm just picking out some elements that I can share with you today. Feel free to go through on these points, dig deeper and review and take your own, own points from it as well. But certainly these four little areas here that came up, again, 
validating what we've just covered through, that focus and link between food and health um, and the importance of actually having an inner health. We know in Southeast Asia in particular, that's quite a strong driver uh, and buying products on the base of what it does to me on the inside rather than, than, than anything else, and even on the outwardly side of things. Um, that continued engagement with digital um, as a method of purchase and running through as well from the e-commerce piece. Um, and obviously with the, with the fragility of the supply chain we've already seen um, with, with the fact that we're relying on global supply and, um, and being challenged in so many areas, um, many of them actually sort of start to start fall down. I know myself, a few of my customers that were getting supply from overseas manufacturers for various packaging products. Um, they were struggling to get access to cardboard, to liners, to labels, and what used to be a six week lead time now become an 18 week lead time, um, causing short supply for, um, for retailers as well during an uptake, during a panic and surge buy. So, so there's a lot of small scale suppliers in the middle of that chain. We're now suddenly being exposed and left without any recourse whatsoever. Um, and that obviously, that break in that chain, then leading towards issues with food insecurity. So these are all little themes that you start to see overlay. You see it coming from three or four or five different sources that starts to set the common truth and you look to see where you sit along that line and the impact it has your particular business so again what that's brought forward is the importance of transparency um, and knowing that that if you have one link in the chain that's broken and a pandemic has proven that that everything can actually fall down and collapse so there's ever been a time to have commercial transparency about your supply chain the COVID-19 pandemic has been the one part to actually highlight that particular point uh, this uh, this slide here and that link that I've given in the previous slide for Deloitte, it actually has a bit more detail about this particular graph. But what I find uh, quite interesting here is that sort of second paragraph where they do talk about building resilience in your supply chain. So again, one of the things that, that we've already seen is that that breakdown. So if you look at your own supply chain, be it local based or one that influenced with something uh, coming through from overseas, understanding what is your backup option. So if you do have something that is relying on an area that may not have gone through a severe um, lockdown, as maybe some parts of regions have, but maybe heading towards one uh, or has already experienced it, what has that shown you in regards to response, um, the threat to your own business, um, what you have in your own background with regards to your risk mitigation program and saying, what do I have as a second or third tier supplier that's readily available to swap over that particular person's role in this supply chain? because in the end, your whole business is at risk if that does break down. And the lovely graph on the left here actually starts to break down those four quadrants as well. And you can see the bottom right, again, that, that, um, that area of rise of isolation. And, and we can see that certainly in American politics over the last couple of years, where it is very much about um, you know, pro-local, pro-local support, but, but then making sure that you do build the infrastructure and that it can be self-sustaining. But then versus that, which is up the top right, we're then looking for that regulated harmony, where things are transparent, was a combination of private enterprise as well as government bodies working together and making sure that you've got quite a robust system in place. So if anything, this is being brought forward as an opportunity for you to review your own supply chain and identify where those links or potential broken links might be and what the damage that could cause to your business all the way forward. So it's quite a nice little article. I recommend you guys to read a bit further on towards that. So let's look at some of these changes in detail. I'm sort of aware of the, the time as well as we go through. Um, I won't go through all this explicitly because the great thing is, is that I sort of wrote this point up and I'm finding evidence I'm going through that supports it. So we've already spoken about the damage to um, all the disruption in the supply chain. Uh, and obviously looking for local options. There's been definitely a drive towards having um, local supplies and thinking um, more about supporting the manufacturing cell. Certainly that discussion piece was quite vocal back around late March, early April um, nationally about uh, definitely building up and reinvesting back into our manufacturing cell and understanding how we can you know, re-employ people that, that may have been displaced in jobs that may take two or three years to actually recover, asking yourself what their skill set is and they had in their previous roles and how they might add value to a whole different local supplier or local option as well. Um, we've spoken already uh, a bit about um, the retail experiences moving online. We really believe that that's one here to stay. So you ask yourself how your brain actually engages with that platform. Do you currently have a channel to market to consumers who purchase your product online? How do you communicate with them on that? 
that way and then beyond just purchasing how do you engage your brand in an online platform through various other social channels that might target and reach your particular demographic? So that's, again, it's not just about a purchase play, but the way that you engage your audience because all your other symbiotic methods of engagement with the consumer through walking the aisles or going through a large big box retailer are no longer present. So how do you keep your brand in their face? And that is that digital aspect that has a play. There has been a bit of a threat, obviously, about that push to disposable from reusable. I've got a couple of examples down the track on that. Probably could argue that it's been a bit of a knee-jerk reaction um, in some areas. We had a good movement building up momentum about single-use plastics, which is the suck. Um, and that was really coming down to a bit of a grafting halt at one point. But we can see rays of hope with that running forward. And maybe one or two streams of that might be challenged in the post-COVID world as well going forward. And again, with that supply chain, you know, people wanting to know and believing that where they're getting a product is safe and being delivered. I found it quite interesting. I was having a few of my clients who actually were based in Wuhan were trying to sell me um, facial masks after they came out of their worst lockdown and we were experiencing ours for about, so I think it was about 20 cents US a mask. Uh, so, so for me to try and, you know, even consider selling masks coming from Wuhan would quite be an interesting sell in itself, but you can understand the perceptions that come at play about what your supply chain looks like and where things are coming about. So traceability and authenticating where it's coming from, if anything, has been around for a few years already in different forms. But again, the need of where it sits in one's priority and thinking has been definitely elevated during the COVID-19 crisis. And again, one would expect when the froth all settles down over the next two, three years at the end of this, that would come down, but one would think that it's been elevated already substantially from where it sits currently. Um, the rise of circularity and sustainability. So again, this has been in constant flow and development over um, the last number of years and especially circular discussions as well. Um, from my side of where I work, many, probably half the briefs that I get in the last 18 months have been around a circularity conversation or sustainability piece. Um, but the key thing here is knowing that it's moving beyond the widget, beyond the product, beyond the pack, but moving more around that system and that collaborative model as well. And I'm finding, if anything, the COVID-19 has shown that the strength and benefit of working and collaborating together and having that sense of community that has been fractured and challenged. So my belief anyway, uh, purely my opinion, is that it will support the growth of a circular model because it does rely on trust, on parties working together and collaborating. So if anything, I'm hoping it would actually fast forward the development of circularity from this uh, as the pandemic shift. Um, and then we've already touched on that brand with purpose. And, and again, the main reason why is that I guess what we thought was true or what we feel that we can believe and trust has been been questionable debunk that you know that so much elements coming in predominantly from North America about growing conspiracy theories taking lead, fake news, division through Black Lives Matters um, uprising as well, and challenging a lot of legacy brands in the food and beverage sector globally about what they call themselves and do you realise the history behind this? And people not questioning that over time, but now having to go back and think about how does this name or how does my position, how does this reflect the brand values that we talk about on our mission statement, that we tell people this is what our brand is about, but my brand name or the way our position or colours or the way that our tone of voice doesn't support that. So it's almost going back and doing audit of your brand value and making sure that the brands you put on shelf are aligned to a very stable sound structure and purpose. And those values are actually well uh, communicated and articulated not only on pack now, but also in these online channels. So it does bring in a layer of complexity, but it's also a great opportunity for people to go back and order and maybe just question a few things and go back from, again, those foundations and build further from it. So a lot of points, a lot of notes through there, but the interesting thing is that going through four or five different channels, we're finding a lot of um, triangulation through this, which validates and highlights what are the common truths. And it's a bit of a collection of things that, that have different scales, different levels of priority, but certainly showing that they are a common impact that has spun out of the COVID-19 uh, genre. So moving forward, here we go. So this one here is a great little comment here from Instacart and, and really highlight a couple of key points here is that Black people put food on their table has changed and obviously they have to sit back and redesign their products and systems. So going back about auditing your own brand, your own product, your own packaging, you may be asking yourself from a different lens, you know, is this the right structure? What can we do differently going forward in this new world? And this is obviously dealing with a 500% increase in, uh, in a year uh, through Instacart is a hell of an impact. And that's been mainly obviously from, from the spike. 
So we look at retails, particular supermarkets. Um, I'll focus here on, on food stuff in, in, in New Zealand, mainly because they went to probably the most severe lockdown globally uh, before anyone else. And, and I think they were shut down for around about 12 weeks uh, at a stage four that we're experiencing here. Um, actually, probably more severe than we're experiencing in Melbourne right now. So they had this happen pretty much overnight and they had to pivot pretty quickly. Um, on this slide, I do have a link at the very bottom under that infographic to the right. Um, and there's, a, I think, about a 10 minute video there from the CEO from um, Food Stuff um, North Island and talking a bit about how they pivoted and pressure they went forward. So I do recommend listening to that video and picking up some other insights as well. But as you can see here, they really had to pivot quite quickly. Um, they realised they became the primary source of food. It wasn't just about takeaway, people going out to eat. People wanted fresh product coming in or prepared meals coming in, and that's where they set up their business to supply it. So it's really interesting to see what they did. They, they mobilised a the student army to deliver to those that were outliers and marginalised, particular older folk, ones that were vulnerable, that weren't used to online. They are the laggards, they ones that won't come across to that online format. We think millennials, we think online, but now we've got people that, you know, I'm, I'm 50 in a couple of months, so my age, I've been pretty tech savvy, but I don't mean that in my age that are not tech savvy at all. So a whole new cohort are coming on board. Um, how, how do you keep those guys engaged and stuck and, and to that particular platform. So if they go ahead and actually help navigate people through the one-way lanes, virtual queues as well, um, and also the guides, the new, the new ways of doing business, you know, the little infographic to the right, they were all become very common with. Um, that becomes starts to be ingrained into the way that you do things. New rituals, new behaviours that you start to learn going forward. And again, the, in the bottom left, I've really covered those points a lot, but probably the, the, the one key one that stood out for me was staying in your bubble. Um, and that really had an impact for over-the-counter service. So thinking about delis, I know Coles and Woolies starting to close some of their delis down. Um, that's more of a cost-saving requirement. But then there's that, that health component about that, that low-touch engagement. So if I've got someone who's handling something in the back two or three times, packing it in and giving it to me versus one that's already pre-packaged, well, what would you go for in this mindset? So pre-packaged starts to come forward as a better method of choice. So that staying in the bubble and having that visibility was one big takeout that I was getting from uh, the guys over in New Zealand in particular. Um, takeout becomes grocery in. So again, you know, people rely on the Uber Eats, Deliveroo's and so on coming forward, but people actually going off and ordering raw ingredients to kick it home. And the main reason why was that they actually knew exactly what they were cooking with. So it was something that was prepared in the kitchen that may not have had, may have had questionable hygiene levels um, or depending on where it was actually, you know, in an area that had a high level of cases. Now, I'd rather go off and get my raw ingredients. I've got time, I'm at home, I'm gonna prepare it myself which then leads beautifully again back to that, that focus on inner wellness and inner health. So I can make wiser choices about my own health and I know exactly what I'm doing. So that was a huge um, increase from that, from that side and that complete swap, swap around. And that obviously then leads obviously to the contactless delivery options, which we've all experienced nationally in various levels as well. And that is something that, that only tends to continue as it then brings people again towards an online method of communication and dealing and force people to actually move towards that platform if they chose not to use that in the past. And once they've moved that platform, you'll find historically, they're not gonna regress and go back. So you've got a whole new audience that have come on board, have learnt through a pandemic that's been forced to by regulation, and they're more than likely to actually stick and continue going forward. So the fear about online is probably nowhere near as it was 12 months ago. Um, and with that, again, we spoke about the cocooning people at home. Um, I've got my gate in my front openly basically every single day with the kids ordering bits and pieces coming through or my wife ordering bits and pieces coming in. So e-commerce packaging waste has gone through the roof. And these numbers, scarily enough, are pre-COVID, the December 2019. Um, so when you start to think about it, this is only probably double, tripled, depending on what part of the world in particular. So, um, you know, companies like Alibaba, for example, Amazon, Dell, these sort of guys as well, they've all gone forward and start to put strict packaging regimes in place in particular to look at taking the waste out. Um, I know certainly in areas like California, going back even 12 months ago, they had a huge problem with the amount of increase of e-commerce um, elements coming forward. And they had to sit down and actually start looking to, to ban a number of materials and um, that went in line with this, banning the single use plastics as well through California, which mimicked what was happening around uh, nationally in Australia as well. So a lot of focus on e-commerce packaging waste and the, the impact on there uh, as well. 
um, the paranoia, changing behaviours and rituals. Uh, you know, one example here, there were a number of, but KFC was one that stood out for me, um, you know, suspending their iconic finger licking good campaign. And uh, I find myself, and I spoke to Jen about this as well, when I go across to the shop, I used to have to lick my fingers in order to open the produce bag to put my fresh produce in. If I can't open that bag, I just put the naked one in and don't even try even thinking about licking uh, my fingers. Uh, same with reading a newspaper. So you start to stop and you think, I've now got this changed behaviour. On the other side, you've got that, that fear and misinformation campaign. There was this video going around that I have a link of one actually just at the bottom because everyone became an expert apparently overnight on, on YouTube about what to do with your vegetables. And it was an image there of, uh, uh, I think she was a Russian lady in America who was showing how you actually put a bit of uh, uh, a morning fresh into a hot, hot soapy water and you wash your cucumbers and your apples and your fruits and so on through there with her gloves on um, and rinsing. So uh, again, this, this misinformation running through was causing a huge amount of problem um, through people uh, and making decisions. So again, the misinformation, the lack of truth, hence you come back to things about um, authenticity, traceability becomes quite important. How do I validate that what you're telling me is actually truth? What do I look for in that truth? Um, and what do you do as a brand to give me confidence that what I'm buying from you is actually sitting in the right path? So these are some of the things that spin off from these outliers and I guess elevated areas of normality. So some case studies here. Um, and again, all of these case studies coming forward in a presentation that Jen would have forward through to you. They're all hyperlinked. Um, they've got some more deeper dive on every single one example. Um, and it, that way you can peruse at your own time. Um, and essentially pick which ones you feel can, can be more relevant to your own business. So looking forward here, looking at some of these emerging tech um, trends, um, obviously it looks at all the different areas of supply chain. It's not just about the package uh, in this particular case. Here, for instance, it's not about this, it's, it's about everything that goes to the supply chain. So on the left are some examples that really have been driven and evidence over over time that have been growing in the CPG area. So your blockchain, automation, artificial intelligence, interactive packaging, augmented virtual reality. Now I know not some of the brands that dialed in today have actually played with some of these in it's some outwardly, some testing in other markets in Southeast Asia, not so much locally. What's interesting, you look at on the left, which is what the trends are growing globally in the CPG sector. On the right, this is actually just from yesterday. This is an ASX, um, so the Australian Stock Exchange small cap conference, which is, is still running today as well. Picking the next themes for investors um, in the next 10 years. And obviously tech has is, is played a huge role and growing role in the Australian sector in particular. What they're interesting though is the alignment of some of these uh, trends and themes that they're putting forward as high growth opportunities for small caps and how they're nicely aligned to these trends that have been around for probably two or three years, but now getting momentum and therefore getting some validation in them actually being a trend and not a fad. And this is, and this is really, again, another way of validating that there's some meat in these bones. Um, which, which for as a brand here in Australia, to consider thinking about investing that are relevant to your market, your channel, your cohort, and your brand. So blockchain is, is one that I believe Dairy Australia have actually done a, a presentation on separately in the past. But again, the key element about the, uh, the blockchain is obviously making sure that you've got transparency and traceability through the supply chain. And the, the goal of that is obviously inwardly, it'd be one about you know, validation and making sure that you've got um, you've good control and providence of, of what's running forward. But from a consumer's point of view, it's about that authenticity um, and, and validation and trust building up. Um, and I guess you as a brand is a great chance to actually capture insights as well. So I've put a couple of um, case studies here and I've, I've done my best as well to try and pick ones that relate to things that can be dairy related. It can be hard for some of these because um, some are very much in fashion or consumer electronics or, um, or retail predominantly and trying to drill down to food and beverage as well as dairy can be a little bit of a challenge in some areas. But on the left, there's one based in the Netherlands here where it talks about an ethical play. So again, in an area where it has so much um, issues with, with providence and sourcing and slave trading, wanting to make sure that, again, their brand platform um, is about being ethical, is about sustainable. So that's their brand value, their brand with purpose, and they support that by investing in blockchain. And that then shows to their customers and consumers the transparency and the advocacy they've got for their ethical platform. So again, if you're a brand that has purpose and feel that is an important aspect of, of what you want to engage your consumers, to maybe validate your cohort or validate your value or premium um, positioning, this becomes a methodology of consideration. 
And on the right here, again, similar method that, that Nestle have done as well, um, using a different um, uh, software part in this particular case. But again, it allows customers to have full disclosure of its milk and palm oil supply chain. So again, if people want to go and have a um, sniper at a brand based on what a news media or an overall theme might be happening globally without doing the due diligence, this is an opportunity for a brand to defend itself and make sure it is doing the right thing, but also communicating that to their audience as well. Um, all their reality and artificial intelligence. I've got a, got a couple covered through here as well. So again, you know, um, AR has been seen as a playful marketing PR short-term aspect. And in some cases it can be, but also if you're trying to get reach and stretch and build a, a, a storytelling moment with your, your um, cohort, it's, an, it's a really good tool to start to engage at a low cost entry predominantly as well. Um, so again, in this case here, I've used an example from New York, Angry Orchids, which is a cider and, and, and uh, uh, and food app development they've actually done. And they're looking at basically pairing. So again, how do you actually pair up food in your, your drink as well? So it, it allows you to become an officiato of your product. It allows you to deep dive into their brand and it gives you a chance to be educated. So it's really building about immersion into your brand, into the value. And everyone likes being the smarter one in the room, um, essentially, and giving you a chance for your, your cohort to actually get a sense of your product tell the story and talk about the heritage, talk about the providence, but then have that journey, which allows them to bring in other parties that starts to build a stronger bond with that particular brand. So AI is using that particular instance to build that bond with their audience. On the right, we've got an example of AI and here at PepsiCo, we've worked with a company called GoSpot Check, where this is more about merchandising and shopper marketing. So here to develop this piece of software, where basically a feed associate can go out, take a photo of the store shelves, that app actually uses the technology to actually identify all the SKUs in the photo and it basically allows them to mix up their product um, uh, mix on shelf. So again, if you think about where, if you've got a national brand in particular, you'll have different demographics, different areas of the market that would be bigger buyers of your product. But understanding the product mix on shelf may change based on those regions. Um, having done work for the Azure in the years, I know um, a Bundaberg rum is an example, 80% of that is, is consumed and drunk out of Townsville. Even, even though it's you know, one, of, one of the largest brands uh, nationally, 80% is saturated in one particular area. So how would they do their product mix in say Queensland versus in other parts down in Victoria where you know, the old Dark and Stormy brand for instance, doesn't sell so much down here, but Dark and Stormy has got really good strong provenance on shelf over throughout north part of Queensland. So again, using this tool and technology to mobilize your force, get insights back to your company quicker to allow you to make further and quicker changes as well. Um, interactive packaging. So again, this is again, getting that engagement with consumers back onto the pack itself. Here's an example and a link here through for Danone. Um, and again, using Spotify. So you know what demographic they're trying to target. You're having a curated playlist. So this is more of the, that enjoyable part that gives you a moment that bounces just off pack itself. So again, quite easy tools to engage. Um, and again, I know a couple of brands that call in today have used this in the past in different parts of the world as well. Very, very popular in, in the parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, flexible fulfillment is a great little one here. Um, this is a Canadian startup. And so we talked about the challenge of getting people to the stores. In this particular case, it's actually taking the store to the people. So you think about an, an oversized Mr. Whippy van, but this time it's actually, you know, co in the health and wellness products and, and staple items that are coming through the streets. So this is a really good novel way to actually start to take things out, playing off that share service, but really bringing things to the consumers when they need it very quickly and conveniently. And what you can really find here, you could almost you know, have another play and you start throwing machine learning and AI. You could almost imagine that as it starts to pick up this journey over time, they can start to pinpoint on data and analytics what things are mostly purchases in regions and suburbs and actually start to allocate certain trucks and loads based on those buying behaviors. So again, like most things involving AI and technology and data, that time bang and accumulation of data and analytics starts to give you a nice heat map and you start to get really good, strong information to start really targeting your product, your type of, your type of eat and the mix and loads you've got for your product SKUs in those particular areas. So really smart, uh, interesting idea. I'm quite keen to see how this can go um, over time as well. Direct to customer. Now this is obviously one that um, uh, has been growing, especially in, in North America in particular. And someone the size of PepsiCo can certainly play this where they've got 
their brain in 94% of pensions across the US. But what they did is, is basically they moved across and realized they had a real bottleneck with their supply chain being challenged through the marketplace. They've moved forward and obviously gone off and created their own direct to market uh, or direct to consumer methodology here. So their own platform, their own um, pantry, so all their own products and people can customize and buy either individually or as pantry kits as well. And actually having an ethical play on there where you can actually forward on and when they're purchasing a certain amount, like you can donate and pass forward items as well. But direct to customers in other area, which is growing quite highly, in, especially in North America, and even now seeing evidence in parts of Europe. The optimised convenience. So again, going for that mobile first retail. Um, for those that are, that are familiar in uh, in Melbourne, Skip was actually designed, developed here in Melbourne. One of the first ones to pick that up, and money around coffee. So again, that that pre order. So you know you're going to be going through a certain path. You can go on to uh, your app. You can start to put in what you want to order. You've locked the order in, and essentially once you arrive to that designated pickup area, you can go off and pick up your order. So no more waiting or or actually uh, mingling in a certain space. You can just basically go in there to pick up and keep going. But having it changed now from where I'm at home and someone delivering it to me, this is me on the go and actually knowing where these hubs are and actually just calling ahead, knowing where my path is going to be and then having it as a pickup spot as well. So that's one that's starting to grow. And some of the major um, uh, brands, Starbucks is actually testing that at the moment um, in North America as an example to expand that even further. So obviously one of the other big things that we're concerned about here with this uh, COVID um, change is what that does to plastic use restrictions, um, the impact. You know, where does that sit with sustainability on the short term and long term? Um, and where does that take that disposables through usables? And certainly, um, definitely across the market, here's some snippets from various news articles in, in, in March and April in particular, where a lot of the, um, the reusable options were actually banned, stopped. Starbucks, McDonald's, Dunkin' Donuts, uh, nearly every single cafe in Melbourne, um, were all basically putting a ban on bring your own coffee cups and mainly about the consideration about sanitisation. So if anything, it's given a good chance to pause about that and maybe question where it's at, but also knowing that there's still a, a, a concern with hygiene, hygiene, but then if you start to look about the reusables, the way things are sanitised become a, a high concern and that secondary use as well has come into play. So the question was, will that go back? We are finding some reusables are now coming back into the marketplace and the disposables thankfully starting to pull back a bit because the last thing we want to do is have a reason to go back into single use plastics in particular. But um, what will be interesting to see what does happen is this shift and growing shift from single use to refillable. Now it's been sitting as an outlier for the last four or five years, many boutique brands, brands with purpose have sort of activated and really just, you know, one or two store locations. When you got Marks and Spence and Nestle starting to make big investments and plays in this area and having global goals, not even have disposable packaging, but go towards refillable as a model in five years time, it's now gone to a whole different level. So, in the short term, we feel this may still have a bit of a concern from a COVID mindset, but then it comes down to really stress testing this model out. So the one on the right in particular, um, meanwhile, there is a link there as well. They actually have a complete integrated system. So they actually try and control the issue they have with the old style traditional bulk bins, which was like imagine refillable version one. This is now version two, and it's a lot more refined. Um, you've got a lot more control about sanitization, reuse models. So now it, it's actually now elevating those concerns or taking those, alleviating some of those concerns over time. So with the backers of Nestle in particular, we can see this refillable movement actually growing. So you look at your own brand, thinking how would that work in this refillable model from not only from a food service point of view, but also considering about in trade and in consumer guidance. So maybe a combination of this on the back of a truck like the grocer going around, which allow neighbors to actually refill arms as they go forward. So again, this is one that is being challenged right now. It will come back and the likes of Nestle backing it going forward is one new evidence that would actually have some links um, going, going ahead. Um, revolutionary recyclability. So again, we've seen some good examples of this coming forward about taking non-packaged recycled materials into recycled items. Colgate Palmolive, five-year venture development through there, a bit of push and shove from the Blue Planet movement in Europe in particular, have now gone to actually make a single polymer-based material for their, their tubes and simplifying their on-pack 
graphic. And on the right here, we can see Pulpec, which is a, a joint venture from a number of major brands and led by Diageo, PepsiCo's involved as well, looking to create the world's first ever 100% plastic-free paper-based bottle. And that's actually going on shelf in 2021. And feedback from guys that are actually in the background on this is that from one, I think the paper bottle for Carlsberg was around a couple of years ago as well. This appears to be the one that is probably delivering the best result in this shift in this format with what they're doing in the, the layer that controls the moisture control on the inside. So one to watch in the next, uh, next year in particular. Um, and now preparing that recycling to assist circular economy. So again, tracking your traceability is key. Um, the Holy Grail is a new initiative being um, launched by Alan MacArthur Foundation. And moving beyond the ARO, which we have in this country, about giving consumers indicators on, on pack, this is actually putting the smarts back into the actual pack via chemical traces. On the left, which the next tech, uh, for instance, have done, especially for black polymers as traces and pigments, versus digital watermarks that are on pack as well. So all the information you put on ARL, or even more information than that, is actually now picked up, scanned by the technology. So this is a collective global movement under the Holy Grail, which is actually looking to actually have this another way to improve the quality of recycle it from the, the correct stream to be captured, quarantined and triaged to assist the circular economy which is a great segue into this towards the end of the presentation, talking again about the value of moving from disposable item into a reusable um, pack. Um, this is a great little claim here from Loop about how many packs it does take to make that shift and across. And as we know, when it comes to circularity, um, Loop and its partner with Woolworths locally, so they are going forward in 2021, if not earlier, depending on how things play out, um, with the Loop model in Australia. It has been launched in Paris, London and New York already, and this is the first place in Australia, and there is plans to roll this out in New Zealand in mid-2021 as well. But again, it's based on the old milkman idea. I'm, I'm certain most of the people that are on the call are well aware of this, um, where basically, again, you, um, you have reusable stainless steel packaging, um, high value item, you use the contained products, put it back in the tote and that's picked up, removed with new product coming in. Um, and obviously the whole idea here is being the value of design back up in this reuse model and talking about retain, retention, that desirable um, ability into the packaging itself, which is an industrial design, is the reason why I'm in the industry, is really adding that as an asset, not seeing as a, as a throwaway item. But the key point here, two key points, the design here is really made for 30 times use. Um, of that product. So really designed that to not just be one or two or three times, but 30 times before it's recycled. And it only goes back into the actual original project, which does make it truly circular. It's like going back to something else. If it's a bottle, it'll go back as a bottle. And that's the key element of circularity. From a business model point of view, you've got this slide already, so I won't spend too much time on it. But the key thing here, especially in Australia, we're very focused on cost of things. So packaging cost on the left is about 10 cents. If you were to come in and say your pack's gonna cost $3, you would fall off your chair, rightly. But when you start thinking about the return rate and the usability, if you prolong the life of that product 100 times, that pack is now only really costing you three cents, not 10. So you think about the infrastructure and support and having something designed for durability and longevity, it takes away having to pick a maybe less desirable material that's gonna be recyclable to one which is fit for purpose that is durable. So the recyclability of it becomes less of a concern when you're talking about keeping the system and having a way for it to come back and being used again and locking the data material through there. So that paradigm is really critical to get your head around on, on that side. And just finishing off in the last couple of slides now, I'm just aware of the time, we start to think about how brands and have pivoted. Obviously with this change, the channel's been challenged, the way you communicate to the market's been challenged as well, and you're being challenged about what you're doing for me. Um, and so there's, a, there's a report here through uh, the Elderman Trust Barometer from uh, New York. So again, consumers are really expecting brands to help during this, uh, this pandemic. And if it means you lose money, that's your problem. But we don't, you know, they'll remember those particular brands. So these are quite high numbers, you know, 90%, 89%, 21%. They're quite high from 12,000 international respondents, not just locals in New York, this is across the world. So talking about how brands should work in coordination with government and relief agencies, you know, brands that should make products directly help the current COVID crisis in particular, and also those, those um, brands that, you know, looking at ones that believe in companies should prioritise people over profits in particular. I've got an example there, which is obviously tomorrow's the Are You OK Day, um, and one that you know, Dare from Lion Dairy Drinks has put on shelf. It was great to see, um, and I'll share it with a few friends uh, as well. So, again, taking that social narrative on, on play, that's an easy, easy in on that. 
ones that are more engaged and ones that have pivoted the manufacturing side. So on the right here are some examples of where retailers and brands have really struggled to meet their normal supply, but they've pivoted. Louis Vuitton have gone off and they've moved making perfumes to sanitizers in one week. Nike has gone off and repurposed elements of their sneakers, the base sole, and used it to make face shields for frontline staff members. And Dyson have gone off and um, gone ahead and actually produced portable ventilators in one week to be used in hospital care. And from a dairy lens as well, on the left here, it's a great little example of, uh, of a, a, a company open in the US where they've gone off and they've used waste from dairy. So again, the whey permeate, the whey acid, all these byproducts, and use it to go off and make hand sanitizers as well. And done in a, in a partnership with Chibani and Aralis uh, through there. And you know, here's some examples here just in Australia as well, looking at some of the distilleries. So again, all gone across Brookies. Mr. Black, I have a bottle of that sitting right here, moving across the same bottle, different label, making hand sanitizer and Archie Rose as well. So some really good pivoting asking what they do really well, what infrastructure do they have, and how can they pivot and change um, based on the situation at hand. Okay, so the last slide. And uh, this is really just one on packaging focus. And again, I do have a link um, on this in a bit more detail. Um, but these are really the seven, seven consumer trends that are looking at driving some of these packaging decisions. And again, we've actually covered a lot of these already. And this is the great thing you'll see, the human behavior, the trends that are driven by COVID, ones that were emerging that have probably been elevated and pushed more forward because of the pandemic, that have actually now got that probably 10 years worth of growth done in, growth done in one year because of the, the pandemic. And, and others that have been around and, and now starting to find a home because people need with regards to experiences and its subscription convenience, which has been more of a run for the lead users, but now it's becoming a standard norm. So all these areas here are ones that have been fortified of anything because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So that brings me right to the end. I think about four minutes left, Jen. So yeah, uh, fantastic. <laughs> Gee, you beat through that. You've got so much to offer. I'm sure we could spend another two or three hours listening to you, Michael. And I've just been a note from Karen about hearing me. So I had everything on full and volume. That's all so. right. I contacted Karen and um, I didn't hear back, so I figured she could hear. Um, okay, folks, if you'd like to type in your questions now, um, there's lots of things to question about. But in the meantime, while you're thinking about that, um, if anybody does need to um, contact Michael, of course, he's not the only packaging man about town, but um, his email is there on the side of that slide, and you've already all got a copy of that. So Dylan has um, put a question in there. So would you read that out, please, Michael? Yeah, blockchain technology is able to sorry, <clears throat> blockchain technology is able to create an ecosystem of producers, suppliers, manufacturers, retailers, consumers, and others, building a safer, smarter, and more sustainable food system for all. Do you know any system in use in Australia? Um, I know two that are in development that I can't say <laughs> about. Um, as far as one that I know of that's being used here in Australia. Um, Off the top of my head right now, um, I can't think of one. I know there is actually one that has been um, being developed here in Australia, but I know two are actually currently in play. And I might have to get back to Dylan on that one, let my um, brain just absorb that, and I can probably shoot something through to Dylan post this um, this session. So um, if I've got Dylan's details, yeah. Jen, I can click something yeah. through. Dylan. Okay, Dylan, if you email me, please, then um, we'll sort that one out. Yep. So I've got a little link here that I'm posting, if you could... Click on that, folks, and uh, we'll copy it and um, give us feedback following the webinar. Okay, we'll just wait a couple of moments for any more questions. I'm sure there'd have to be a heap after that. That's what I look like. I sort of rattled, rattled through a fair bit there, but as I mentioned, on the, on the presentation, what I've made sure is I've put a lot of hyperlinks um, across the board. So certainly, mm. um, when there's a snippet or a reference of something, that feel free for, um, yeah, to, and it, it takes interest in particular to um, just click on the hyperlink um, or again, you've got my details there. You can shoot through an email um, as well. I'm happy to um, to answer any questions as well yeah, on that yeah. point after the Gosh. session. Yeah, there is so much happening, isn't there, as a result of COVID. Uh, thanks, Sharon, for joining. Um, yeah, shows Sharon said lots of food for thought. Excellent presentation. Yeah, it's, fair, it's a fair bit there. And, and one of the key things, and again, it's, it's um, each person dialing in is coming with their own um, 
I guess, in the impact of their own business and, and each one will have a different, some, some I know are actually having the best time of their lives at the moment. So it's quite interesting, the, the variety of, of impact that businesses are having um, locally in particular. So certainly um, I would be looking at some of the things that I've covered through here in relative to your particular channel and thinking forward, because a lot of these things that have, that have sort of been brought as the new in particular, especially the online um, aspects and development channels because of COVID, um, they, they are here to stay. They, they're not going to necessarily regress back. Um, look, historically, any development of technology doesn't regress back. People don't go off and buy a, a um, you know, start a streaming service, then go out and pull their old VHS or beta um, systems again. Once it goes, it's one way direction and one way traffic. So if you're a brand that doesn't really engage in an online um, platform or channel, that's one area that probably needs a bit of focus and development. Okay. Um... There's a couple of extra things just popped up. Yeah, so phasing out, so Julie's put the queer, phasing out single use plastic versus COVID needs for hygiene creates just, it does, just position. And that's, that was the point uh, uh, before. And, and we're certainly finding, um, and I think I did mention that the refill in particular is one that's going to be a bit challenging in the short term. Um, but if anything, it, it has it has stress tested uh, that one good example, and we spoke about this with the FSNZ guys, um, when it came to over-the-counter service and, and deli, they got a lot of single-use plastic items for takeaway containers. So they basically shut that entirely down during um, during COVID and everything was pre-packaged. And even now, when they've gone back before the most recent stages, they've returned, um, before that lockdown, so 100 days of no COVID activity, they still weren't fully returning back to over-the-counter supply. So there was the lingering element of that. And also going back and if anything, fast tracking discussions about finding more reusable options to take that out of place. So um, you're right, there, there is that lingering aspect. And I think it's going to be each sector is going to cater for it a little bit differently. But the key thing about the reusables really comes down to sanitisation. So if you look at Loop as an example, um, they have EcoLab as their partner. So they have medical grade sanitisation levels. So again, it starts to elevate the bar and expectation for us as consumers about what they do for sanitisation. So I want to see how they're sanitising it. I want to know their methodology. Is it medical grade? And those are the sort of things that I would now demand of a brand that might be playing that particular space. So it's just gotten harder. It's raised that bar. That's fine because that bar probably should have been there already and it may have taken three or four years to get there. But because of this, it'll bring that forward. So the quality of what we'll be getting out there for the players that are still around will be ones that we should have and actually bought for about five years. Okay, so one more there from Ian. Uh, I'll read out the first bit. He said, that was very impressive, Michael. Material that I think is relevant to a number of areas across dairy businesses. It will be interesting to see how all this plays out, particularly in the packaging space. Do you have a feel for how successful Loop has been overseas? Uh, look, good question. It's it's still um, early days. I think the benefit Loop have had, they've got uh, a lot of support from Alan MacArthur Foundation and a lot of the, the global CPG plays because it fits in nicely with their, I guess, their external rhetoric and strategy about their good citizens and aiming towards 2025 goals. So I think that's nicely aligned. Um, the metrics, uh, I, I have been asking a few questions about the metrics in the background. I know from an investment play point of view, it's quite an investment from a tooling perspective to get in. You're talking, you know, a quarter million dollars for half a mil for tooling investment, for instance, for some of the reusable re, um, uh, formats and structures. So it is something that you have to have as a regular return element to to make those, the numbers coming back. The, the LCA side as well, the reports have been done internally by, um, by the group. Um, I think on the slide I put on there, I did put an asterisk that it was their own uh, research and it was claimed after three or four uses that it, it basically is a net improvement on the environmental play. I would say it's probably more than that. Um, 30 seems to be the magic number and there is evidence for even like return R that you can go forward to 10,000 uses. So it's still um, rolling forward. Certainly the uptake, people coming on board has been successful. Um, the, the question would be, you know, really I'd say probably better ask in about six months time when it's been almost a full year, when it's been out of the marketplace, especially in the New York um, sector um, as well. But certainly there, there are many that are clamoring on there. The rubber, rubber maze is another example where recently they've um, partnered up with TerraCycle, who are the founders of Loop. Um, and they've essentially opened up a whole model where they're taking back all of 
any storage containers from even their competitors' brands, where they're using that as a base material source to produce new products. So the, the spin-off from that whole model is, is far-reaching, um, and certainly Loop is a, is a great PR vehicle as a starter, and uh, especially for circularity. And the, I think give another six months in and we'll have some better metrics around that one. Fantastic. So with that, we better close off this webinar. Thank you folks for participating, but thank you most of all to you, Michael, for all the hard work you've put into this presentation. Hopefully and we look you. forward to, to um, another presentation sometime in the future. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate it.